Welcome, everyone. My guest today is Mike Simonson, founder and president of Altos Research and the host of the Top of Mind podcast, to talk about inventory and home prices this spring. Mike, welcome back to the podcast. Great to be back, Sarah. Always great to have you on. You are the man with the data. You have it all. Uh, I know that Logan's always looking at it. Our newsroom, Will, our data journalist, that Altos research data is amazing and is going to be one of the reasons we have such a great conversation today. Awesome. Let's dive in. Let's do it. So um, I really want to focus on here we are, you know, end of February, almost headed into the real spring, the real spring home buying season. And the things that are on people's minds about this, I would say top is, of course, mortgage rates, but home prices, right? Like where are home prices going when we have mortgage rates so high? So we'd love to uh, kind of pick your brain a little bit about what you're seeing as trends. So uh, price trends are definitely tied in with our inventory and sales rate trends. Um but, you know, what was, I think the interesting things to think about home prices. So home prices finished 2023 surprisingly up. We finished up three, four or five percent, depending on your measure. Uh, I think the, the Fannie Mae number said home prices climbed six percent in 2023 over the year prior. Uh, and so going into the year, we were looking at that momentum continuing. Um, and as uh, rates have really been rising since January 1, like the low point, the recent low point was was at the end of December. And so rates have been rising all year. They're now back in the sevens. And we can see slowdowns happening uh, in uh, in numbers of offers getting made and, uh, and things like some of the leading indicators of where sales prices are going to happen in the future. So I started the year looking pretty optimistically for home price gains for the year. Um, and, uh, but some of those signals are, they're weakening right now. And it's, uh, you know, middle of February, uh, third week of February now. That is crazy. Um, so from your perspective, so of course, those are national numbers we're talking about, but Altos, one of the beauties of it is how local you guys get. Are there places that are, I mean, obviously we know that national number is not everywhere, but are there places where we're seeing really strong home price appreciation? There are places where we have, uh, we have continued to see home price appreciation through last year and the momentum is continuing right now. Um, these are places like um, actually uh, a lot of the Northeast, uh, some of the central markets, and then actually some of the far West markets that were um, like at, at still have fewer homes on the market now than a year ago in the Northeast. Some of those Northeast markets are still at record few homes on the market. And so those tight supply areas have uh, continue to have uh, price support because they have a sufficient buyers for the the really restricted levels of inventory. The weakness areas uh, that we see are the Gulf states. Uh, so it's really interesting. Southwest Florida uh, inventory is climbing there uh, through like New Orleans, some of the Louisiana markets, and then into Texas. Um, and you can see. Uh, the softness in some of the in some of the Texas markets. So um, and so that's both uh, inventory climbing and uh, price softness. You know, Austin was maybe the the worst market, worst the softest market of 2023. Uh, with uh, with inventory was rising, was higher than it had been in you know a decade, um, and uh, it looked to me like late last year, Austin found a floor. It finally found the floor in, in home prices that the rest of the country found eight months earlier or, or 12 months earlier. And so, um, and so, you know, like, it'll be really interesting to see as rates bounce back over into the sevens, does that resume for places like Austin that, that, you know, were, were really slow to find the floor last year? Interesting. You know, you mentioned the the Gulf states and the Gulf part of Florida. Tampa was one of the fastest growing, you know, highest home prices that we saw in 2023. What do you see so far in 2024 for that market? You know, Tampa, <clears throat> Tampa is 
rising inventory uh, has the is among the highest markets with price reductions right now. So what we're tracking is every home on the market, which of those have taken a price cut from their original list price. And normally about a third of homes, a third, of, it's probably more like normally like 40% in Tampa would be normal to take a price cut. And uh, right now it's over 50% have had price cuts in Tampa. And so that shows weakness for future sales. That means I've, I'm, my house is on the market now. And I haven't gotten any offers. I do, do a price cut so that maybe I get an offer in March, which will close in April and so uh, what we're seeing now is we can see the softness in those prices there. And really price reductions is an excellent leading indicator. And one of the, one of the indicators we see nationally for uh, why, why, we can, why I think the price appreciation, the surprising price appreciation from 2023 is slower suddenly. Um, and that's because, well, right now about 30% of the homes on the market have had price cuts. Um, that's flat right now at a time in February when often you're getting new inventory, fresh inventory, which doesn't cut a price yet. And if you're getting offers, then you have fewer and fewer price cuts in a given week in, in hot, hot years, even last year, you could see fewer price cuts every week in February uh, as a percentage of the market, because there's the, it's like people are buying the homes. Um, and this week it was kind of flat. So the slope of that price reductions curve is telling us that uh, that that people are sensitive to rates. Rates have moved from you know mid sixes to seven point two, like maybe fifty or sixty basis points in six weeks. And uh, and consumers are wait wait, and the ones that offer do maybe do so at a little discount. Um, and so we can see that in uh, we can see that in the price reductions data for that's taken the the wind out of those sales that, that we started the year with. Well, let's talk a little bit more about inventory and seller behavior, right? So the reason that every year we have about 30% uh, of homes take a price cut before they sell is because, you know, I would, I would think that means that like uh, there's a certain number of homes on the market. They're just mispriced from the beginning, right? Like they, they haven't found, you know, the yeah. market for that isn't right. Or, or it's it's totally normal. Sometimes it's a strategic move by the seller. Sometimes it's a you know a listing tact, a marketing tactic. Sometimes it's a it's like a, you know it is a disillu dis a not disillusioned a uh, a seller under uh, you know a, like some illusion about what the house is worth, right? Like a crazy seller uh, and is fishing. So whatever the reason, sometimes it's accidental or sometimes it's intentional about a third take a price cut before they sell. And, and so it's normal, right? And some people, like I've heard people say, look, if you don't do one price cut before you get an offer, that means you underpriced. Whatever the, right, that, so like those are um, uh, totally normal markets have price cuts. When markets are hot, then some of those crazy sellers get the offer they were fishing for. And so now that you can watch and then, you know, price cuts, instead of being at 30 or 35% nationally when, during the pandemic, they were at 15% in February. So a bunch of people who were fishing got their offers. And, and it, because there were so many and there were bidding wars and they missed out on the one down the street and all of the things that come into play uh, make that happen. And so then right now, you know, we're in the normal range. It's about 30% of the homes have had price cuts. Uh, it started the year fewer than last year and on a nice down curve, but as rates have risen, uh, you watch that slope uh, decrease. And so we can watch that pick up a little bit in um, and, and like be an indication of softer home price appreciation. Now, if I look at home prices across the country right now, we're still up a couple percent from 2023, right, February of last year. Um, but it's compressing each week. And uh, last year at this time, it was recovering. And this year it does, uh, is not, it's not like uh, people are waiting, you know, uh, just a bit, just enough to, to take some of the wind out of those sales. 
So February um, is a really important month as we look to like, hey, okay, this is we're, we're about to hit the spring. So what are you looking for in this month that that tells you it's going to be a strong season? It's going to be weak. Like what are some of the things you're seeing there? So the 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 biggest um, narrative, the biggest story of 2023 was how few sellers there were. And so we could track that with the new listings data that that you and, and Logan look at all the time. Uh, and what we've noticed is that um, sellers are coming back into the market. Um, they held off for 18 months. And so now they're easing back in. Uh, so each week we have, we're having more uh, new listings than last year at this time. So this, this week was like 16% more new listings than last year. And so that implies to me more sellers implies more sales can happen in 2024. One of the reasons, so we had fewer, we had lower demand last year, but we also had lower supply. We were supply restricted. And, and so as supply eases, more sales can happen. Uh, and, and that's exactly what we're seeing. Slightly more sales uh, starting to grow. Uh, but even that has, that pace has slowed as rates have, have gone up, right? So the, the pace of those sales has slowed as rates are now at, you know, 7.2 or something today. So, um, so that's really, you know, the, 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 so the thing I'm looking for is do the new sellers come up and then the sales start falling, do, do those diverge? Uh, and they could, right? If rates go to eight or seven and a half or eight, like those, those sales are going to, the, the new pendings are going to fall off. And, and so then we're going to watch inventory really build. So this is, um, you know, as you know, I'm a mortgage rate lockdown person. You are not, and Logan is not, and I am at a severe disadvantage with the data that you guys have because of what you just said. Like when you're, when you're looking at that, you see that when rates rise, then people who have their homes stay on the market longer. Um, but maybe, maybe not so many homes come on the market. Maybe you can explain that a little bit. Yeah. So um, I wouldn't say that I'm not a mortgage rate lockdown person. I would say that I think the lockdown that assumes that we are locked down because rates are high has it has it inverse. The lockdown is because rates were so low. So the normal think of think of 7% as normal. The anomaly is 3%. And so what happens when it goes from normal to the anomaly, it goes from normal to 3%. That means fewer homes are on the market. People are buying more and holding more. When it's super cheap to hold, own real estate, we own more. And so as we stay in the sevens or upper sixes, then, then we can imagine that the no, more normal conditions take over. So more sellers come back, slightly come back, uh, and inventory builds. So, you know, when, um, you know, when rates are higher, demand slows. When demand slows, inventory grows. Uh, and and so in this case, what we're seeing, it, we're seeing exactly that, right? You know, rates are higher than they were a year ago. Inventory is higher than they were a year ago. Rates are dramatically higher than, than they were two years ago. Inventory is dramatically higher than where they were two years ago. So people, um, we, the people who are locked down are, you know, because we had the anomaly, which was a cheap, cheap rate. And so then thinking about like what happens next, if rates fall and it gets cheaper again, we're going to buy more. We're going to take them off the market. We're going to hold it more. And so inventory will fall again. Um, the, uh, and so that's the way I think about that. Not that there isn't a lockdown. It's just that the, it's not the fault of the 7%. It's the fault of the 3%. And, uh, and so uh, that's where we're getting. So now each week um, we are seeing more new listings. Uh, and we are seeing more new listings for a couple of reasons. One is that, you know, those people held off for 18 months. I had my 3% and I, you know, I, now I have the second kid. I really need a new home. I'm going to hold off and wait, but like, I can't wait any longer. Right. So some of those are people are coming back, uh, when rates are at 7%, we also know things like, you know, if I bought an Airbnb unit and it didn't, and now it's not getting all the rents I expected. Um, like now I gotta, I'm going to like, it's more expensive to hold or it's, or I want to buy the next one. And I can, and the first one's at 3%, the next one's going to be better. 
but I got to sell the first one to finance the next one. So we say so you get those phenomenons where where we uh, phenomena where we each of those contributes to more new listings. And so we're seeing that, right, that that we're getting off of the lows of 2023. And that's uh, durable. It's been like three months or like every week for three months in a row. Like it's growing. There's no question it's growing. It seems durable all year. If rates fall to five or something like then then you're going to watch it re- re- retract and um and uh and the other the other th- thought there is that i find we found that that consumers are more sensitive to changes in rates than to the absolute levels and so if rates stay at seven percent now i'm shopping at seven percent and i know what i can afford and i know what it, what the demand is for my home and i have an idea if rates go from seven to eight the change is what matters. If rates go from seven to six, six is going to feel super cheap and you're going to see an acceleration, which we saw last year in January and February. We saw it start in December this year, but then then rates kick back up. So you can see how quickly people are going to be sensitive to rates falling to the changes in rates. Well, let's talk about the specifics of inventory this year versus last year, right? Um, What what were we seeing last year when those rates did dip a little bit um, in January and February for actual inventory numbers? And what are we seeing right now? So right now, there are uh, 494,000 single family homes on the market around the U.S. That is 13% more than last year at this time. Um. Last year, so norm, in, in pre-pandemic years, you would expect somewhere end of January, early February would be the low part of inventory. You'd start to get the spring inventory would come in, you'd get, uh, and, then, and then inventory would start building. Since 2020, inventory has been falling February into February into March. We have more buyers and sellers and, and, and you know, even in 2022, end of the, the great deal, uh, people were, they were still trying to get it in, you know, three and a half percent, 3.8, and they were still trying to squeeze in a, a good bargain. Uh, so lots of inventory getting purchased up really quickly. Uh, so what we're seeing this year is inventory fell this week by half a percent or like two tenths of a percent. And um, it, when last year it fell by one and a half percent this week. So significantly more relative levels of demand a year ago. Um, and again, you know, it's like uh, as rates are higher. Rates are significantly higher than they were a year ago, 100 basis points or something. Um, and so demand is weaker. And as demand slows, inventory grows. So, you know, you can see those pieces coming in there. Um, so sometime in the next couple of weeks, I expect us to see inventory starting to grow. Uh, for the year, uh, we're already 13% more than last year at this time. You know, a week ago, it was 12%. Two weeks ago, it was 10% more. So the, the in, it's, you know, it's separating. Um, there is no sign of any like flood of sellers, right? We still have, we have more sellers than we used to, than we did last year, but not as many as like 2019. Still a lot fewer. So there's no flood of inventory there. But that implies that all year long, we're going to have more selection for buyers, which is not a surprise because a lot of people are waiting to see if, you know, rates get cheaper. Um, and, and, um, and so we can see that build is, is definitely happening. So clarify for um, that, that 400 something number, is that just existing home sales? Is that new and existing home sales? Tell us what that is. And wh- what would that number have been in 2019? So um, that number is, uh, it's new and existing. Um, it's the Altos number for measure for single family homes across the country. And in that we, we do include some uh, new construction, but there are, there's, there's also, there's a ton of new construction that isn't actually a house yet. It's not actually for like, it's a, it's a lot and you could go buy the lot and then move into the house in a year. Some of those things are, we take out of the Alto set. So it's, if you're a home buyer today and you're like, I need to buy a single family house today. Your choice, you have a, you can choose from 494,000 single family homes. Like that's the universe. That's what's in that number. There's, there's uh, all kinds of stuff, you know, that are around the edges that, that, uh, you know, might be included uh, in a different number, you know, like, 
that that you might see in a different uh, measure, other like NAR or somebody who does a different measure of how they count inventory, but that's what the Altos number is. So there's 494,000 single family homes that you can buy if you wanted to buy a house today. Um, and, um, and so then compared to 2019, it's a third fewer than 2019. So that, you know, we were still in the, the whatever, eight, 900,000 range this time of year in 2019. Um, and maybe it's 800,000, something like that. Um, and each year prior to 2019 was more than that, uh, because rates were falling during that time and the inventory was falling during those periods as well. So, um, so it is still a third fewer homes on the market. There's still a third fewer new listings than there were at that time. Uh, even though there's more than last year, there's still fewer. So there's no flood of inventory. There's no like investors rushing to sell out or, you know, um, foreclosures happening or anything like that, that, that would be uh, creating a significant amount of inventory. So I'm glad you brought up some of those things. You know, we've looked at those really specifically over the last year. The Airbnb bust, I thought, um, you know, uh, we dug into your data because it was like, does that have legs? Because a lot of people, I mean, I, I, there is some evidence that that you've had a slowdown in um, the amount of uh, nights being rented. Some uh, We've also had different jurisdictions really outlaw or curtail the number of nights you can do or the kinds of houses you can do or whatever. There, there has been a lot of change over last year, but what did you find when you when it looks like actual inventory coming from that? So uh, first of all, I had uh, Jamie Lane, who is the chief economist for AirDNA, who is uh, the company that focuses on um, on uh, short-term rental data. I had him on the Altos Top of Mind podcast last week. So if you want to dive in, people want to dive in further, they can look for that one. Um, but what we can see on inventory is, and we talk about all these things, by the way, what we can see on inventory is that um, there is essentially no indication of, um, of, of uh, short-term rentals like flooding the market. Now, it could be that some of the markets like, you know, Cape Coral, Florida, um, you know, which has the, the biggest inventory gains year over year. Uh, maybe some of that is because some of those folks are short-term uh, rental investors that are unloading them. That, that could be part of that mix. And those play like Southwest Florida or you know, maybe Palm Springs, California. Palm Springs, I think, put in a, a uh, um, short-term rental like bans and, you know, and so what do they mean? But um, but in general, uh, there's no I don't see any flood of these sellers. In fact, New York City put in, you know, a big ban of uh, on their short term rentals. And what, what my hypothesis was, is that that was going to have essentially no effect on uh, on on inventory. Um, people aren't suddenly going to sell those properties, but it is going to impact hotel prices because if you're, if you're traveling to New York, now you have dramatically fewer options and that's exactly, and Jamie Lane confirmed this for me, uh, that, that that's exactly what happened is so those folks still have properties they want. They're going to rent them in different ways or they're going to use them. Or if you've got a 2.8% mortgage, maybe you don't rent it at all. Like it's, it's super cheap to just hold it. And so because we have that scenario, uh, there's, we've seen essentially no movement on uh, inventory. Now, they, like, maybe some, like maybe some of the markets that, that are showing um, greater inventory now, uh, maybe that's part of that mix, but it's not a lot. Really interesting insight. Definitely, uh, listeners, you should definitely be listening to the Top of Mind uh, podcast. It's a it's a great listen, and that one in particular. You know, as someone who travels to New York a lot, I have two kids in New York. Um, I also, you know, we have a lot of industry events in New York. I can tell you absolutely that you feel it as a traveler going in there. It's like, and I wouldn't always stay. I, I wouldn't stay in Airbnbs when I was there for business. I've had, you know. Uh, mixed mixed uh, luck on that, let's just say, in New York City for business. But still, boy, you can really see it. It's crazy. Yeah. And I, I personally love, you know, 
prefer to stay in Airbnbs in New York City. But uh, and I haven't traveled since the band there since the band, so it'll be really fascinating to see. But yeah, you know, you know, Airbnb that that like is a that's a travel business. It's not a housing business. Right. Short term rentals are, are, you know, it's a hospitality business It's more akin to hotels than it is to uh, long term rentals. And uh, but those properties are generally really well financed right now. They're they everybody has a low rate and a lot of equity. So even if your revenue dropped, it, you went from making ten thousand dollars a month to four like you, your payment's only 1800 bucks. So like, it's still, a you know, like, so very few people are in a, in a, um, like a real tight bind in that space right now. Well, and I, um, uh, because I, I travel a lot and every time I'm, I, you know, I'm on Airbnb a lot. And I would say that, um, when I would look, I, I try to like have the whole house or whatever. And in New York city, that was much rarer right? Almost always, or a lot of times there is someone living there that, that you're sh sharing it with. And that's why I was like, you know, even when they do this ban, it's not going to be like, um, you know, those people are going to sell because they actually live there. They already live there. Yeah. They were just making some cash. Yep. The, the funniest story I have is that I had an Uber driver and, um, this was probably four years ago and we were talking about, and turns out he, he rented, um, his, part of his apartment. Not only did he rent uh, one of his bedrooms, he rented the couch. And if you, if you were on that couch, you had to sleep with his dog. And I was like, what? <laughs> I don't know. I might pay think... extra for the dog. I know. I was like, you are the <laughs> ultimate in like, you know, and people would do it. And I was like, oh my gosh. So anyway, well, <laughs> Mike, thanks so much for being on today. Um, love Altos. Um, love the data you're providing and the insight that you guys provide with it. It's not just like, here's a bunch of data. It's like you're really giving people um, an understanding so they can make decisions, business decisions. You help us a ton. So thanks for being on and come back again soon. I absolutely will, Sarah. Thank you so much. Bye.